Hello everybody, Jesse Morrell here with Open Air Outreach. I want to uh, talk today about a topic, a doctrine uh, that I'm very passionate about. Uh, I've been studying it for many, many years and uh, it really just paints a uh, beautiful, uh, wonderful picture of God and really vindicates his character from uh, charges of, uh, you know, uh, imperfections in his character. And, and uh, that's the issue of open theism. Now, uh, I'll write this on the board. I'm going to be using my whiteboard today to, uh, you know, help along with this uh, teaching. Uh, open theism, sort of a strange term if you're not used to it. Uh, uh, open theism relates to the nature of reality uh, and to the nature of the future. Uh, this idea of uh, the future possibly being open, or at least partially open. Of course, theism uh, is, you know, belief in God. It comes from the Greek uh, theos, which means uh, God, and uh, theism would be the belief in God. A theism would be a denial of God. So, open theism is the belief that God has not predestined all future events, but that there are future events that are open. Uh, that may or may not happen, the uh, you know, element of contingency. And uh, so the issue of open theism relates to the foreknowledge of God, and I'll write this on the board, uh, foreknowledge, or uh, you can also call it the omniscience of God. Uh, omniscience means all knowledge. Uh, but it's, it's not primarily about the foreknowledge and omniscience of God. Uh, the issue of open theism is primarily about the nature of reality. Because God's knowledge of the future corresponds perfectly with the nature of the future. Uh, God's knowledge of reality corresponds perfectly to the nature of reality. So the debate of open theism, while it relates to the knowledge of God, while it has uh, definite implications to the knowledge of God, it's primarily a debate over the nature of reality. Has God predestined all future events, all sin, all misery, all uh, you know, torment and agony, you know, all, you know, future uh, choices of men. Has God predestined everything that happens in our world? Or are some things open? Because the nature of reality affects these things. Now, in the Calvinist system, in the beginning, God predestined everything. And so the future in the Calvinistic system is comparable by analogy to a straight line, and I call it a straight line of certainty. And so the Calvinist will say, God foreknows with absolute certainty all future events, because all future events are certainties, because God's predestined all future events. However, if you have a free will theology, then the future does not consist in mere certainties. This element of contingency given to us uh, by our free will means that the future is not a straight line of certainty, uh, but really more of a web of possibilities. It may branch off here, maybe branch off there, Maybe branch off here. It's, it's, it's the future has many different alternatives, many different courses, depending on the free will choices of men. Uh, drawing it out, it makes it look like, you know, well, the Calvinist view is a stick and the open theist view is a tree, uh, a tree with many branches, a, a tree with many alternatives and possibilities. And as we're going through uh, life, we're making choices. Every day we're making choices. Uh, we might choose A or we might choose B. It is not yet decided. So when it comes to God's knowledge, God does not foreknow with absolute certainty all future events 
because not all future events are certainties. If I word it another way, I would say uh, God does not foreknow all future events as certainties because they're not all certainties. God foreknows some future events as possibilities. So both the open theist and the Calvinist believes that God is all-knowing or that God knows reality as it is. The debate is over what is the reality that God knows. And so uh, oftentimes Calvinists will say, open theists deny that God's omniscient. Uh, open theists deny that God has foreknowledge. And that's not, uh, you know, really accurate. Now, if a Calvinist will ask me, you know, hey, Jesse, does God foreknow all future events as certainties? And I would say no. Then they would say, oh, so you deny that God knows all things. And I say, no, not at all. Uh, God does not foreknow all future events as certainties because not all future events are certainties. In fact, if God thought something was certain when in fact it's not certain, then he would not be omniscient. And uh, so the claim that open theism denies the omniscience of God is not, it's not accurate. Uh, it's a straw man. It's a, uh, uh, you know, a, a boogeyman, a theological boogeyman that Calvinists have invented to try and scare you away from a free will or open theistic uh, perspective. It's just as unjust for them to accuse open theists of denying the omniscience of God as it would be for an open theist to deny that Calvinists believe in the omniscience of God. Uh, you know, if I go to a Calvinist and I ask, uh, you know, hey Calvinist, uh, does God know that the future has open possibilities that may or may not occur? The Calvinist would say, uh, no, God does not know that the future has uh, open possibilities. And if I say, oh, so you deny, you deny that God's all-knowing. God doesn't know that the future is open. God doesn't know that the future has possibilities. You, you deny that God's omniscient. They would say, no, no, God does not know that the future has possibilities because the future has already been pre, uh, you know, decided. It's predetermined. So there's no if, ands, or buts, or maybes about it. Uh, it's already settled. So God knows the future as certain because the future is already settled. And so uh, it would be just as unjust for me to accuse a Calvinist of, uh, you know, denying the omniscience of God because they don't believe in my view of the nature of the future as it is for them to say open theists do not believe in the omniscience of God because we deny their view of the nature of the future. And so uh, in the Calvinistic system, in the beginning, all things are settled because all things have been by God predetermined. In the open theistic worldview, in the beginning, God created man with a free will. And because he gave us a free will, our future choices have different options, different alternatives, different possibilities. An A, B, or a C, uh, you know, or a, a D, uh, or, or an F, or, you know, even more and more. Uh, you know, it could be uh, limitless, uh, all the different variations, all the different alternatives, all the different possibilities. And uh, God, being omniscient, knows them all. He knows all of the possible choices that we could make. He knows all of the different alternatives. And so if you think of uh, the Calvinist system being a straight line of certainty, but the open theist system being a web of possibility, and in their view, God knows the future as a straight line. In the open theist view, God knows the future as a web of possibility. In which view does God have more knowledge? In which view does God have infinite knowledge? Well, a straight line that never ends is infinite in one direction. So you could say, yes, a Calvinist believes God has infinite knowledge. But an open theist has an infinite uh, 
web of alternatives. So many different variations. Mathematically, I mean, come on, I don't, there's not a mathematician alive, and never has been and never will be, who could calculate how many alternative possibilities there are, given how many people there are, and how much free will every man has throughout his life. It, it's, it's unfathomable, inconceivable, it's infinite. And so certainly the open theist readily acknowledges that God has infinite knowledge. And I would contend there's even more knowledge that God has in open theism than in the Calvinistic system. Because to know a web of possibilities, an infinite web, is uh, greater than to know a straight line, uh, an infinite straight line of certainty. Now, the, uh, you can call him a classical Arminian who believes that God foreknows with certainty all future events and that God has given us a free will. And they would say that uh, God simply foreknows with certainty all of the free will choices that we will make. Uh, this is absolutely logically uh, incoherent, inconsistent, and contradictory. Because free will means possibilities. And for God to foreknow the future as certainties means that there are no possibilities. And so the, uh, you can call it classical Arminianism, is inconsistent on that point. Now, I don't know if it's really classical Arminianism. Uh, a lot of Arminians have had that view, but there's been Arminians who have been open theists. Uh, L.D. McCabe, for example, wrote two books in the 1800s dealing with uh, you know, what he called divine nescience. Uh, and so, you know, there's been a, a open theism throughout Arminianism, but the idea that God foreknows with certainty all future events, and yet that we have this free will, it's, it's inconsistent. The Calvinist is consistent. The Calvinist says God foreknows all things because he's predestined all things. Perfectly logical. The open theist says God knows that the future has possibilities because the future has possibilities. Again, logically consistent. But for those who say, well, there's, you know, possibilities because of free will, and yet God from eternity has foreknown them all with certainty. Uh, he's foreknown the outcome of these possibilities. He's foreknown which possibilities would definitely be chosen, even though they were not predetermined. Even though they were not uh, decided by God, yet God from the beginning knew which choices every man would make. Uh, that is logically inconsistent, contradictory, and incoherent. So uh, what is open theism? This is a, a, a general uh, you know, preliminary understanding of the uh, basic uh, uh, system of it, but there's more to it. And uh, let me erase the board here and we can start a new topic. Now, under the open theism, not only does uh, this relate to the nature of reality and how the omniscient mind of God must perfectly correspond to the nature of reality, uh, it means, uh, as, as already uh, alluded to and stated, that the future events... are not foreknown with certainty, which is what we've said, and therefore there is in God a uncertainty. Uncertainty. Now, uh, biblical support for this, of course, you know, uh, so far, all we've talked about is the concept, the idea, you know, a straight line of certainty or a web of possibilities. Uh, you know, up to that point, it's just uh, I, an idea, a concept, uh, even philosophy, if you will. But what is the position of the Bible? What's the biblical position? Can you say biblically that God has had a uncertainty about which future events would or would not come to pass. Now the first uh, instance I want us to look at is Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. 
Now this was when I was first contemplating open theism, this was one of the scriptures that was greatly impressed upon my uh, heart relating to this. Uh, Genesis 6, 5 to 6 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. So here the Bible is saying when God saw how wicked the world had become, he repented of making the world. It grieved him. Of course, this also relates to the debate over passability and impassibility. Does God have emotions? Does God have feelings? Can God be hurt by his creation? And uh, given this verse, I would say absolutely. In fact, I'm writing a book right now, and I've been touching on the issue of passability in God, uh, that he has a divine pathos. And uh, so far, just that little section for my book dealing with that has turned into a hundred pages of verses after verses after verses that teach the passability of God. But relating to open theism, it's, it's implying here that had God known, had he known that the world was going to turn out the way that it had turned out, he wouldn't have created it to begin with. And that's why he sent the flood. Because that wasn't the world that he wanted to see. That the, the creation that he had made had corrupted and perverted itself. It was not what God wanted it to, to be. Now, Calvinists often use this idea of sovereignty, meaning that God gets everything that he wants. Uh, everything that happens is God's will and God's plan. Now, when a Calvinist uses the word sovereignty, you can be sure that what they really mean is puppetry, that there is no real free will, but that we uh, have alternative choices to make, uh, the power of contrary choice, but that uh, God has set every choice uh, for us uh, from eternity by his irresistible decrees, and everything's going to happen according to his will. Uh, but here, the implication is that uh, they were not doing what God wanted. They did not fulfill their purpose for creation, or for their creation. And so God repented of creating them and destroyed them in the flood. And so, uh, relating to the open theism and foreknowledge of God, God did not know with absolute certainty that the world was going to become so wicked. Uh, he knew the possibility. He created the possibility when he gave Adam and Eve a free will. And so he knew it was possible for them to sin. Uh, he knew it was possible for the world to become wicked, uh, but he took a risk. He did not know with absolute certainty that they would become wicked. Why? Because it wasn't certain. It was open. They had a free will. God had not predetermined it. God, had not, uh, God did not tell Adam, you know, don't eat from that tree, and the day that you eat, you'll surely die. Wink, wink, you know, as he secretly behind the scenes, you know, forces him and shoves him, uh, you know, down uh, to eat the fruit. Uh, that's not what happened. When God uh, created man, he didn't want man to sin. <sighs> but he knew it was possible, but he didn't predetermine it. He didn't fix it. So this is one evidence here that God does not foreknow with certainty all future events, thereby implying that the future is not a straight line of certainty, but a web of possibility. The next verse uh, we want to consider comes from uh, Jonah chapter 3, starting in uh, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came on to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go on to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went on to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. 
and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let the man and the beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they had turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. Now then we know uh, in chapter 4, Jonah gets upset with this, and he says in verse 2, And he prayed unto the Lord, and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying, when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. And so here we have an example of God giving a prophecy that in 40 days Nineveh would be overthrown. And it was not a conditional prophecy. No conditions were expressed. That's why when they repented, they said, who can tell if God will uh, turn from his anger? Who can tell? You see, Jonah had given them no promise that if they repent, God would repent. So they repented in the hopes that maybe, just maybe, God would spare them. And then it says, when God saw that they repented, then he repented of what he said he would do, and he did it not. In other words, God canceled his own prophecy. Did God know with absolute certainty that Nineveh would, be over, uh, that Nineveh would repent? Did God know with absolute certainty that Nineveh would not be overthrown? And the answer must be, uh, you know, he did not know with absolute certainty that they were going to repent. Because if he did know with absolute certainty, he lied to them when he said, in 40 days you'll be overthrown. Now, God cannot lie. Was it true? Well, yes, it was true. They were going to be overthrown in 40 days. But what happened? They repented, then God repented. The future was changed. Uh, and that changeability of the future is open theism, that the future was changed. So when God said, in 40 days you'll be overthrown, that was true. They were going to be overthrown, but the future changed. God genuinely repented of his plan. He canceled his own prophecy. Now, had he known that Nineveh would not be overthrown in 40 days, yet he said they would be overthrown in 40 days, maybe to manipulate a response like their repentance, then God was deceptive. God was manipulating. And uh, so for the sake of the veracity of God, for the honesty and truthfulness of God, we must say God did not know with absolute certainty that they were going to repent. Uh, Calvinists will say, oh, but Jonah knew. Jonah knew. That's why he didn't want to go. No, no, no. Jonah didn't want to go because Jonah was an open theist. He knew that God was gracious and repents of the evil. He knew that God might repent of his prophecy. He didn't say that uh, he knew with certainty that Nineveh would repent, but he knew that if Nineveh did repent, then God would spare them. And so it's not saying, oh, look, well, Jonah knew. Jonah knew they would uh, repent and be spared. No, he didn't. He knew they might. He didn't know that they would be. And so uh, this, again, the fact that God repented indicates that uh, he had a real plan uh, that he changed his mind about, and that plan was to destroy them to destroy this city. That was the course of the future. But when they repented and God repented, that course changed. So they were not destroyed in 40 days. Uh, God, for, for God to genuinely repent, to change his plan, uh, would imply that God is in time making decisions uh, in, the, in the now, uh, responding to changing circumstances, and does not foreknow in advance uh, with absolute certainty uh, all of the future free will choices of men. Now the next verse that we want to look at is uh, Isaiah 5, starting in verse 1 to 4. It says, Now will I sing to my beloved, a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it, 
and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it in the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Did you catch that? He looked that it should bring forth grapes. But what did it do? It brought forth wild grapes instead. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. Now, I'll tell you a secret. Calvinists hate open theism because it rips the carpet out from under their feet. They attack open theism, slander open theism, misrepresent open theism, uh, say it's heresy, it's blasphemy, open theists are not Christians because it completely undermines their system. Here is an example. Well, in the Calvinistic view, all future events have been predetermined and everything happens according to God's plan. But here God is saying, look, he wanted grapes. Did he get it? No. He got wild grapes instead. What more could I have done, he said. What more could I have done? Well, how about issued uh, some irresistible decrees? Could have done that. Could have started there. How about, how about exercising your sovereign will and forcing all men to do uh, uh, what you want? No, see, so God is saying, look, he did everything that he could of course, consistent with their own free moral agency, consistent with their own humanity, for them to bring forth grapes. All the conditions were right. He, he had the uh, vineyard, uh, you know, prepared properly, and yet it brought forth wild grapes. So uh, it was not God's fault that they brought forth wild grapes. It was their own fault. That's free will. And so Calvinists hate open theism because if open theism is true, Calvinism is wrong. If open theism is true, man has a free will and God has not predestined all things. And so here, in this uh, example, God had a failed expectation. Failed expectation. He expected one thing and he didn't get it. Now, uh, disappointment in God implies failed expectation. Now, I've, had, uh, I've heard some people that are, they, they, they claim that they're not open theists. And yet they'll talk about, oh, God, gave, God took a risk when he gave us free will. Well, wait a minute. Uh, God can't take a risk in giving us a free will unless uh, you're an open theist. Because God already knew with absolute certainty what you would do, so there was no risk involved. So for, an op for a non-open theist to use that language is a contradiction. I, I had another, a friend of mine, he's not an open theist, and uh, he talks about, oh, God has been very disappointed. Well, no, you can't say God has been disappointed if you're not an open theist because disappointment implies failed expectations. And uh, that means God expected one thing and it didn't happen. In other words, open theism. That not all future events are for known as certain because not all future events are certainties. And therefore, God even has an uncertainty about the future because the future has a web of possibilities. The next verse I'd like us to consider, Jeremiah 19.5. And uh, this is uh, repeated also in Jeremiah 32.5. So God says it twice. And if God says something twice, it's very, very important. Now here he says, And they have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. Neither came it into my mind. I was debating a uh, Calvinist uh, informally, uh, you know, on Facebook. This guy, uh, uh, Cy, who uh, is a Calvinist and, uh, you know, a presuppositional apologetic uh, guy. Uh, but he was, you know, uh, uh, you know, upset about abortion. They had this abortion film, uh, the documentary against abortion. And, and you know, uh, I pointed out this contradiction 
that in, for Calvinists to be opposed to abortion is for them to be opposed to the will of God because in their system, all future events are predetermined. So for a, for a Calvinist to be upset is for them to be upset with the will of God. Uh, maybe a Calvinist right now is upset that I made a video about open theism. Well, hey, God predestined me to make a video about open theism. And for you to get upset with me for, for teaching and preaching open theism is for you to be upset with the will of God. Now here, this verse is quite explicit that when Israel sacrificed their children, it was not God's will. God distanced himself from what they were doing. He said, I didn't command it. I didn't speak it. It didn't even come into my mind that they would do this thing. Now, how can he claim such a thing if, in the Calvinistic system, the sins that they were committing actually originated in his mind? In his eternal mind, he planned it. In his eternal mind, he decreed it. In his eternal mind, he not only knew that they were going to do it, but he purposed that they would do it. How could he say, neither came it into my mind in the Calvinist system? If God is uh, truthful, if God is honest, in, the, in Calvinism, he could not say this. But the fact that he says it, again, uh, supports this system of open theism. That God did not plan for them to sacrifice their babies. He didn't want them to sacrifice their babies. He didn't know with certainty that they would do it. Now, did he know that they could? Of course he knew that they could. But he didn't know that they would. And that's the difference. He says, neither came it into my mind. Now, only the open theist, I contend, can accept this verse at face value and can accept this verse for what it is actually saying. Only the open theist. And that's why, uh, again, I contend open theism is not only logically uh, coherent, it is the only view that is consistent with all of the Bible, with all of what the Bible says. Uh, were some things predestined? Absolutely. The Bible does talk about things being predetermined. There will be a judgment day. Every soul will be in heaven or hell uh, one day. And uh, so, you know, some things are set. Some things are fixed. But not everything. Some things the Bible contends is open, uh, that you have alternative possibilities. So open theism is coherent with all of the Bible, consistent with all of the Bible. And for any theology to be inconsistent with the full counsel of God's Word uh, must be a false theology indeed. Next verse I want to consider. Uh, Genesis chapter 22, verse 12. This is about the story of Abraham. And God told Abraham to take his son and, you know, sacrifice him upon the altar. It's a foreshadow of Christ, how God gave his own son. Now, Abraham, I believe, knew from the beginning that, uh, you know, knowing the character of God, that somehow God would uh, intervene, you know, and he told his son that God would provide, uh, you know, an animal for him to sacrifice because the son said, hey, what are we going to sacrifice when we get up there? Abraham said, God will provide an animal. Uh, so, uh, you know, Abraham trusted in the character of God, and that's why he passed the test. Um, but uh, here, when, um, when he lifted up the knife to sacrifice his son, and God intervened, this is what he said. And he said, Let, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son thine only son from me. He said, now I know. There's some pretty serious theological implications with that expression for God to say, now I know. Meaning, uh, it's not something he knew with absolute certainty before. Now, uh, you know, certainly God knows the hearts of men. How does he know the hearts of men? Well, uh, you know, he tests the, the hearts of men. Uh, when God tested Israel in the desert, it says he tested them to see if they would keep his commandments or not. 
Well, that implies that God did not know with absolute certainty how they would behave. Because free will means that there's a contingency uh, in A or a B, different variations, different possibilities. And with Abraham being put to a test like that, this was his only son, the promised son. What would he, what would he do in that situation? Well, it was open. But once he uh, you know, proved to God that he was not going to uh, spare his son if God had commanded him um, to sacrifice him, then God now knew with certainty uh, you know, that, that Abraham uh, truly feared God in this regard. And so there's theological implications to God uh, communicating this way. Uh, some people try and say this is all just anthropomorphic language. And that comes from the Greek anthropos, which means man. Anthropomorphic uh, means, you know, describing God in human terms. But uh, we'll, I'm going to do a, a video about this uh, anthropomorphic issue. Uh, anthropomorphic descriptions uh, de are, are meant to describe a literal truth. And the literal truth of an anthropomorphic description is not the opposite or a complete denial of the anthropomorphic description itself, which is what the Calvinist would have you to believe. God says that he repents, but that actually means, uh, you know, he doesn't repent. You know, God says that he repents, but he doesn't really. No, an anthropomorphic description is meant to communicate a truth, a literal truth about God. They're not meaningless. And the meaning of an anthropomorphic description is not the opposite or the denial uh, of, uh, of what is being impressed uh, in that language. So uh, next, uh, I'd like to talk about, it, you know, relating to open theism here, um, not only does it mean future events are, are not foreknown as certainties, because they are not all certainties, uh, and therefore there is an uncertainty about the future. Uh, but as we have uh, at least uh, seen at least a, a bit already in some of these verses, they all kind of tie together, that the future is in part undetermined. And a undetermined future would mean that some things are not yet decided upon. Uh, here's an example, Matthew chapter 24, verse 20, and this is repeated also in Mark 13, 18. It says, But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean pray that your flight be not in winter? Hasn't God already decided whether it's going to be in winter or not? Hasn't God predetermined in eternity's past whether it would be on the Sabbath or not? Why are we now praying about the future as if the future is open, as if the future is undecided? You see, I contend even a Calvinist, the staunchest Calvinist, is an open theist when he prays. Because prayer presupposes a yet undetermined future. It is a yet undetermined event. It presupposes an openness that your prayers would be considered by God and He would make His decisions in light of those prayers. That He would determine the future or determine a future event in light of your prayers. So it means that, the, that at the moment of your prayer, it's yet undetermined. I remember hearing John Piper say, oh, well, you know, he, he obviously must have recognized this dilemma between a predetermined future or an exhaustively predetermined future and uh, prayer. Being, so why pray? If it's already been decided on, what, what use is prayer? Isn't prayer useless in that way? Well, Piper said, well, when God determined the future in eternity's past, he took your prayers into consideration because he knew what your prayers would be. But that, that, that's not really a, a coherent uh, system of thought because if God predetermined everything that you're going to do, then God's the one who predetermined your prayers. And then uh, for him to then determine the future in light of your prayers is simply him uh, you know, responding to his own plans. It's, it's, it, you're not really contributing anything. 
he, he decided it all. He decided what you would pray, and then he decided to make other plans in light of what you pray. Uh, it, it doesn't bring any more meaning to prayer in their system. It's, it's not really a coherent thought in my mind. Uh, because, you know, uh, he, he not only would determine uh, future events in light of your prayer, he determined that prayer to begin with. So there's no uh, contribution on your part, no meaningful, no real contribution on your part. Uh, it acts as, you know, that almost presupposes an open system that God simply uh, intuitively uh, foreknew something, not because he had determined it, uh, but just because of his infinite mind, he intuitively foreknew it, uh, that, you know, uh, you're going to pray this, and yet some things were at that moment undecided, and so he decides them then. Well, the whole idea of God predestining anything means that it was previously open. He can't predetermine it if it's not open to him. Uh, if it's already settled in his mind, he cannot then determine it with his will. And we're going to get into that in another video relating to foreknowledge. Again, this is meant to be a preliminary introduction. Uh, so, open theism implies a yet undetermined future, and the Bible does teach a, and imply that. Uh, the next to uh, consider open theism would imply a changeable future. It's changeable, or I like another word, flexible. If you were to contrast it, it would be, say, a concrete future. Everything is set. Everything is concrete. Or it's changeable. When it comes to flexible, everything is fixed. Or things are flexible. You know, sort of the difference between a rock and a piece of clay. Um, when you have a piece of clay, you can mold it, you can form it. Now, God is a potter. And for God to be a potter, that would imply then that to him, it's flexible. He's deciding. He's determining. He's making plans. So to him then, the future is, at least at that moment, open. It's not a stone. You can't form and mold. You can carve a stone, but you can't, you can't uh, be a potter you know, with a stone. And uh, so... Uh, open theism implies a changeable, flexible future in contrast to a con an exhaustively concrete and exhaustively fixed future. Now, yeah, what's the biblical support for this? Well, uh, there's quite a bit. We'll just give you one example. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 6. Now, God sent Isaiah the prophet to, uh, or to, to the king Hezekiah when Hezekiah was sick. And uh, Hezekiah was told, you need to put your house in order, you're going to die, you're not going to live. That's the prophecy given by Isaiah. Isaiah leaves. And then uh, Isaiah uh, is told by God, you need to go back. Because Hezekiah prayed to God. And uh, because Hezekiah prayed, remember prayer can change the future. Prayer has a contribution in determining the future. Uh, God decided to cancel that uh, uh, initial prophecy, to cancel that first prophecy, sent Isaiah back again, and now Isaiah had a message, you will live and not die. So the prophecy was canceled, the future was changed, and this is what he went on to say, and I will add unto thy days 15 years. Verse 6. I will add unto thy days 15 years. So here, the Bible is speaking of a changeable future. He added 15 years. Those were years that were not previously there. When God first said, you're going to die, you're not going to live, those 15 years were not there. He was going to die. God was not lying to him. God was sincere. God uh, it was truthful. He changed the future and added 15 years. So this implies a changeable future, an open system of possibilities. In other words, it implies open theism. Uh, this is not the, uh, the only example of a changeable future. Uh, for example, Mark 13.20, And except that the Lord 
had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he has chosen, he has shortened the days. Well, hey, here, this is the opposite of what happened with uh, Hezekiah in Isaiah. He added 15 years there. Now he's talking about shortening the days, subtracting days. Well, a future that can be added to or subtracted to is a changeable future. It means that the future is, to God, a open system of possibilities that he at any moment is free to determine and free to decide uh, you know, what those uh, things are going to be. In other words, that to God, the future is open. He can add to it. He can take away from it. This isn't the only verse that speaks of God lengthening or shortening days. Uh, the Bible talks about him lengthening the days of the righteous or shortening the days of the wicked. In other words, uh, he can change the future whenever he wants. Now, that's a good question to ask Calvinists. Uh, you say, hey, God is sovereign. You say God is all-powerful. Can God change the future? Can he change it? Or, or must it all occur the way he has foreknown from eternity's past, intuitively uh, foreknown and predetermined it to be. Because if God can change the future, as the Bible implies, uh, then you have open theism. So, uh, in which system is God truly uh, sovereign? Uh, in the open theist position, for God to shorten your days or uh, lengthen uh, your days, uh, you know, that's up to his own sovereign discretion. So an open theist does not deny the sovereignty of God in that regard. Uh, hey, can God cancel his own prophecies? That's a good question to ask a Calvinist. Can God cancel his own prophecies? If they say no, then they deny uh, that really God is uh, sovereign, that he can, at his own discretion, cancel a prophecy. He did that with Nineveh. He did that with Hezekiah. He canceled his prophecy, even reversed it, completely reversed the prophecy. Well, hey, if God uh, is sovereign, then God can cancel and reverse his own prophecies whenever he sees it fit to do so. And so uh, here, open theism teaches a changeable, flexible future. Okay, so now, now that you have a general understanding of what open theism is uh, and what it teaches, that the, the future has a web of possibility because God gave us a free will in the beginning, that some events are uncertain because they uh, have not yet been settled uh, in, uh, by the will of God. And if they haven't been settled by the will of God, then they haven't yet been settled in the mind of God. Uh, and of course, if they haven't been settled by the will of man then they are not yet settled in the mind of God, that God's knowledge must perfectly correspond to the nature of reality, and therefore, you know, uh, he knows that the future has alternatives. He knows uh, that open theism is true, uh, just like, uh, you know, Jonah uh, knew that open theism is true. Ultimately, everybody presupposes open theism throughout our life. As I said, even the staunchest Calvinist is an open theist when he prays. Even the Calvinist cannot escape the presupposition of open theism. It's an inescapable presupposition of the mind because it is the nature of reality, the freedom that we have been given. And uh, so uh, now that you have this general understanding of what open theism teaches and, and, and the concepts and ideas of it, uh, I want to explain why I personally became an open theist. You know, I, I did not always uh, uh, know what the Bible taught on this. And for a long time, I assumed that God simply foreknew all future events with certainty, uh, but I didn't understand the theological implications of that, that that meant everything is already uh, settled, everything's already fixed, uh, nothing can be changed, uh, that that is really a view contrary to free will. Uh, and so uh, when I was first introduced to the concept, I was with uh, Brother Jed Smock out on campus uh, preaching in the open air, and a student asked him a question about God's knowledge. And often they'll say, look, what does it matter uh, that we're sinning? Uh, God knew I was going to sin when he created me. So if he knew I was going to sin when he created me, and he chose to create me anyways, then God created me to sin. You know, or they say, well, uh, why, if God is good, why does he create people he knows are going to go to hell? 
if God is good. So Brother Jed was giving some open theist apologetic answers. And at first I thought it was kind of strange. And I thought, well, I guess, uh, you know, you know, he's got some, uh, you know, strange views. Of course, I had never been exposed to it before. But I, I found out many of my other friends were open theists as well. Uh, another fellow campus preacher, Jim Gillis, and uh, uh, other mentors of mine, David Ravenhill, uh, who was the son of Leonard Ravenhill. And David uh, was an open theist. I remember sitting in his living room, talking theology with him. And uh, he's the one who pointed out to me in Genesis when God said to Abraham, Now I know and uh, what that entails. And so uh, I, uh, you know, was introduced to the concepts through, uh, you know, David Ravenhill. And Winky Prattney uh, was another man who introduced me to some open theistic ideas and concepts. And so I, one day I realized, you know, it looks like a lot of my friends are open theists. Brother Jed, Brother Jim, Winky Prattney, David Ravenhill. Now these are guys I look up to. These are uh, guys that are, you know, I go to with questions, sort of mentors in my life. And so I thought, well, there must be something to it biblically uh, or else these guys wouldn't believe it. You know, these guys love God. They love his word. They know his word and uh, they wouldn't believe it, you know, if there wasn't some biblical arguments for it. So I didn't dismiss it. I was open to the idea and I was on my message board. This was back in 2006. And some guy gets on the message board and starts railing against uh, open theists. And uh, open theists are stupid. Open theists uh, have a, a different God. It's not the God of the Bible. Uh, open theism is unbiblical. And, uh, and he said, you know, uh, prophecies, prophecies prove that open theism is false. Now, I wasn't an open theist, but I got on there saying, look, look pal, uh, they do have some biblical arguments. And I went to Jonah. And I went to, you know, Jonah chapter 3. Now, you're saying that prophecies disprove open theism, but I would say here in Jonah chapter 3, prophecies uh, actually tend to support open theism because there's been prophecies God has canceled, Co prophecies God has changed. And uh, as I was arguing with, arguing with this guy, I realized the only, the only consistent, logical view of Jonah chapter 3 that does not bring into question the veracity of God is the open theistic uh, worldview, the open theist answer uh, to that. So I asked this guy a question, and I'll write this question here. And this is, again, really uh, what sealed the deal for me. Uh, I didn't read books on open theism uh, at this point. I read, after I was convinced open, the open theism was biblical, then I read other books. Uh, the Foreknowledge of God by Gordon Olson, uh, Divine Nescience by L.D. McCabe, uh, God of the Possible by Gregory Boyd. I read those after I was convinced of open theism from the Bible. This is what sealed the deal to me. When I read Jonah chapter 3, did God lie? Did he lie? He said in 40 days they'd be overthrown, and in 40 days they were not overthrown. Was that a lie? Was Jonah a false prophet? The Bible says if a prophecy doesn't come to pass, he's a false prophet. Does that make Jonah a false prophet? His prophecy didn't come to pass. But knowing what the Bible says, that God cannot lie because he is so committed to truth, he's voracious, he's, he's honest, and he expects us to be as well. And hey, what a hypocrite God would be if he expects us to be honest, but he himself is not. Did God lie? And of course, any, any pious Christian would say no. With an exclamation point. No. Okay, fine. But now you need to support that no. Scripturally and logically, coherently, how can you say God did not lie when he said something that didn't happen? How can you say he didn't lie when he said something would come to pass and it didn't come to pass? And the only answer that I could come up with is that the open theist is right. God changed the future. What he said about the future was true at the time that he said it. And then he changed his mind about it later. It was not a mere anthropomorphic description. Hey, if, if God does not really repent, as the Calvinists would say, then in the Calvinist Bible, uh, Nineveh was destroyed in 40 days. In the Calvinist Bible, Hezekiah never recovered from his sickness. If God does not repent, then uh, these prophecies would have come to pass. 
but he did repent. It was a genuine repentance. And the genuine repentance of God led to a genuine change of the future. So it was not a lie. It was the truth. They were going to be destroyed in 40 days. When he said in 40 days you'll be overthrown, that's true. And then when the Bible says God repented, that is true. And so there was no lie. There is no deception, no manipulation. It was all true. So there I am on my message board debating this guy who's attacking open theists and coming to the defense of open theists when I myself was not yet an open theist. And I realized that the open theist position was the biblical position. And that without it, you could not answer a simple question like this in a logically or biblically coherent way. Did God lie? If he knew that they would not be overthrown in 40 days, yet he said that they would be overthrown in 40 days, he lied. He spoke what he knew was false. He spoke what he knew was, tr what was not true. He said they'd be destroyed in 40 days, but he knew they wouldn't be because he knew they were going to repent with absolute certainty because God predestined their repentance. Well, then he lied to them. He lied to them. And so uh, I became an open theist, uh, you know, exposed to the ideas through others, the concept uh, through my friends, but convinced of it through the Bible. And then became more educated on it by other books from other authors, and there is more scriptural support for open theism than I ever dreamed. You know, I'm, I'm amazed, absolutely amazed. Uh, it, when it comes to something like original sin, Calvinists are diehard, original sin is biblical, and, and when you ask them for biblical proof, they give you, you know, like five different verses. You know, Psalms uh, 51, uh, Psalms 58, uh, Romans 5, uh, Ephesians 2. I mean, they have just a handful of verses that they think support the idea that babies are born sinners and babies are, are born evil. Uh, by the way, none of those verses say that, uh, just to be clear. But yet they believe it. But when it comes to open theism, there's a mountain of support, a mountain of evidence, a, a list of all the verses that support open theism. And yet, and yet Calvinists will say open theism is unbiblical. Uh, open theism, uh, it's not Christian. Uh, the God of open theism, lowercase g, uh, is not the God of the Bible, you know. Uh, that, these are the types of things they say. Give me a break. Uh, give me a break. Uh, the reason I believe in open theism is because I believe the Bible. And for me to deny open theism would be a denial of what I know about the Bible. So I can't deny it. Not only do I presuppose it throughout my daily life like everybody else does, but I'm convinced of it through the scriptures themselves. So I hope this was a good uh, lesson for you. This is uh, just a, a, I just wanted to make a quick introduction to open theism. I got uh, plans to make a whole series on open theism. Uh, you know, how does open theism explain prophecy? Uh, what about the word foreknowledge in the Bible? Or, uh, you know, is God in time or outside of time? You know, if God's in time, what are the problems with that? If God's outside of time, you know, are there any problems with that? And, uh, you know, these types of questions that relate to the open view, I uh, probably have like five or six different videos I'd like to make. Does God repent or is it anthropomorphic or, uh, you know, anthropopathic? Uh, is, it, is it a real, literal description of God? And uh, so we're going to talk about all these questions and all these issues, and I hope to have a great uh, series. I hope that you're edified by it and encouraged by it. Uh, personally, my walk with God has been very blessed, especially like those verses in Genesis 6, 5 to 6, when God saw how wicked the world was and he repented of making the world. What does that tell me? It tells me God is holy, God is good, he, and God is loving, and he didn't want us to sin against each other. He didn't create us for all the misery that we've experienced in this world. He didn't create us for that. That wasn't his plan. That wasn't his heart. And when he saw all the misery we were causing each other through sin and all the wickedness, it broke his own heart. It grieved his own heart. And that's why he sent the flood and found a righteous man to save Noah uh, because that the world that he saw was not the world that he wanted. And so open theism to me has helped me understand God and more importantly, love 
Him more. It's one thing to understand God or to study God. You know, many people go to seminary, they go to Bible college because they want to know about God. But it's, it's what, what, what really matters, the greatest commandment of all, is not to know God, it's to love God. And open theism has helped me to love God. Now, I did start a group on Facebook called the Open Theist Reformation. So you can go on uh, Facebook and find my Facebook group and uh, find some other open theists uh, that you can, you know, uh, ask questions to. Uh, you know, we'd love to answer your questions. And, you know, um, you know maybe you're an open theist and you want some fellowship. Uh, go on Facebook, uh, the Open Theist Reformation. And I believe we need a reformation uh, theologically in the church today with a uh, open theistic perspective, a free will theism. Uh, amen. So, uh, okay, well, God bless you guys and check out my website, openairoutreach.com. We got free resources there, different blogs. Uh, I got a blog for my ministry reports, street preaching stories, salvation testimonies from evangelism. Uh, we got another blog that we link to at Open Air Outreach uh, for my theological articles. Uh, I link to my YouTube videos, link to my bookstore. Uh, I have some different books uh, that I've published. Uh, actually, two of them relate to open theism. Uh, I took L.D. McCabe, who was that Methodist Arminian professor of theology or philosophy in the 1800s, and he wrote two books relating to this topic. Uh, he called it Divine Nescience. I republished those two books in one volume. So if you go to openairoutreach.com, you can find my bookstore that way. And I uh, hope that these resources bless you guys. So God bless you. Have a great day.